So good afternoon everyone and thank you for joining us for the first of our series in webinars from Ophthalmic Consultants of London. There is one CTC point available for this webinar for optometrists, dispensing opticians and contact lens opticians. Um, the lecture is going to run for 45 minutes with questions at the end. So if you do have any questions, um, please enter them in the Q&A box at the bottom and we'll get through as many as we can at the end of the lecture. So today's speaker is Ali Mirza. He's a director and founding partner at Ophthalmic Consultants of London. He's also the clinical director of ophthalmology and lead consultant ophthalmic surgeon at London's Imperial College Healthcare Trust. So Ali, I'll leave it over to you. Thank you, Bonnie. I'm just going to share the screen. Let's get this going. There we go. So uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, many thanks for joining us. Obviously, this thing is uh, more geared towards optometrists, but I know there's a couple of ophthalmologists and some industry personnel on here, so uh, everyone's very welcome. Uh, we're going to be talking about cataract and refractive lens exchange. We're also talking about some new uh, technolo technological uh, advancements in lens technology. So let's go to the first slide. In terms of the outline for this talk, we're going to do a little bit of anatomy, just a recap really, types of cataract, and then a couple of things of how this all applies from the optometry perspective, uh, particularly with cataract surgery and referrals, that's becoming increasingly more important with the increased involvement in, in optometrists uh, with uh, hospitals. And that's going to become uh, even more prevalent moving forwards, given the, our current crisis. I'll then talk about the surgery, and then I'll uh, mention refractive lens exchange, how that differs slightly from the, the whole cataract side of things. And then spend a little bit of time talking about the types of replacement lenses that we now have available to us. So anatomy is all going to be very familiar to you. You've got the cornea there, your iris there, and the lenses behind the iris. And this is where cataract development uh, occurs. If we look at the lens in a little bit more detail, you see this is the lens in cross section. So you have suspensory ligaments uh, supporting it. You've got a central lens nucleus surrounded by a cortex, and then your lens capsule surrounds that with lens epithelial cells lining that capsule. If we take a little journey uh, into the eye, we'll see that what happens as the uh, lens ages, the first thing that happens is that the lens stiffens up, the muscles weaken, uh, we begin to lose our ability to read, so that's presbyopia. So that typically happens in our mid 40s. And then as we age further, the lens itself becomes cloudy, which then affects our vision, which results in basically blurring our vision, which is progressive uh, as we age. Cataract is defined as any pacification of the crystalline lens of the eye. So the basic types of cataract include nuclear sclerosis. That's probably uh, the, the most common type. That's formed by new layers of fiber which is added by aging, and that compresses the lens nucleus, can also induce uh, what's called index myopia. Cortical cataract, another type of cataract where you get fibers added to the outside of the lens, which age and produce cortical spokes. And then you have the posterior subcapsular type where you have opacities in the central posterior cortex. So that can affect younger patients, may cause glare, uh, plus or minus deterioration in near vision, and that's typically associated with medication, predominantly steroids. So if we look to, uh, back to our diagram here, you see the nuclear cataract affects this area here. The cortical cataract will be the area here, and your posterior subcapsula sits around here. If we look at these uh, diagram here, just some clinical examples of what cataracts look like. Many of you have seen this already. This is the cortical cataract with the spokes. You've got your posterior subcapsular with the uh, back of the lens being affected. And this is the reason why it causes pretty predominant symptoms, mainly at night. And then you've got a mature type cataract where, in this example, the whole lens is white and very little is seen. What are the risk factors for cataracts? Number one, increasing age. Uh, then there's diabetes. So it's associated with diabetes. You can get cataracts earlier if you're diabetic, eye trauma can cause cataracts. Uh, if you're uveitic or have had uveitis, 
um, you're bound to be using lots of steroids or may well do so for prolonged periods of time, topically in the eye, and that can induce cataract. If you take steroids systemically, that can also induce cataract, particularly the mysterious subcapsular type. If you smoke, there's a preponderance to uh, cataracts earlier than expected. If you get UV exposure, uh, again, you can uh, cause cataracts earlier than expected. Certain metabolic disorders and inherited conditions can also predispose to cataracts. So you can get cataracts at any age, you can even get congenital cataracts. What are the clinical features? The main chief complaint is gradual loss of vision. Uh, obviously there are differential diagnoses to that, particularly in the age group of the sort of 70 plus. So you do need to think about things like macular degeneration. The other features, dazzle and glare, especially at night, monocular dipropia, so it's uh, caused by light scattering induced by the cataract that causes multiple images, and it's still present when you cover the other eye. Uh, frequent spectacle changes, that's quite common with index myopia, the uh, nucleus chloratic type of cataract. So diagnosis is confirmed by retroillumination of the cataract using a handheld ophthalmoscope, and you can also um, to examine the patient with the stint lamp. Surgery, so that involves removing the lens and replacing it with an intraocular implant. Standard operation in the UK is what's called phaco emulsification. I'll come into that in a bit more detail later on. Uh, careful assessment of the preoperative eye allows for customization of the new lens. And there is no absolute threshold of visual acuity at which surgery is indicated. Obviously, CCGs, depending on where the patient lives, do have thresholds um, that's typically the driving standard of vision where they allow us within the NHS to do the surgery. But we know that patients are, can be symptomatic even before their driving standard is, uh, their driving is affected. And we know there's presbyopic correcting implants available, and I'll come into that a bit later on. So in terms of what to consider from the optometry perspective, there's three main things. The first is when to refer. The second is, preoperative assessment of patients, and the third, post-operative complications. So let's have a look at that. So in terms of when to refer, patient's vision is reduced to a point where it's interfering with their lifestyle and needs. So it's important to check with the patient with their symptoms. And uh, that's quite useful because sometimes we do see patients in hospital where they've been referred because they've been diagnosed with a cataract. But when you ask them, do you have a problem with it? And they say, actually, no, I'm coping all right, thank you. In which case, we send them back to um, back to the uh, optometrist, the referring optometrist, and they, they see if they can cope with an up updated spectacle prescription or as best they can. And some people just genuinely don't want surgery or are not happy to have surgery until they're particularly disabled. So it's probably worth asking them. So you made the diagnosis, you said, look, how bad is it? Is it affecting your lifestyle? Can you see the TV? Can you read? And uh, you do know that if we refer you in, you're likely to need an operation. And some patients will say, fine, that's fine. Please do refer. And others will actually, it's not that bad. I don't want any surgery to my eyes. I'll give it a little bit longer. And then you see them again and reassess them and then refer them uh, when the time is right for them. Preoperative issues, four major issues to consider. Preoperative investigations, uh, anticoagulants, diabetic control, and posture. So let's go through those. So those are preoperative investigations. We really don't need much for cataract surgery in terms of anything systemic. Um, nothing's required other than blood pressure and BM um, for over 95% of patients. And this is borne out by various trials that have shown that um, routine preoperative testing, bloods, etc., is of very little benefit. And nowadays it's not done. In terms of anticoagulants, they should not be stopped uh, preoperatively, so there's good data to support that. Patients may often ask you to say, oh, should I stop my aspirin? Should I stop my warfarin? Should I stop my clopidogrel? And the answer is no. Uh, in terms of warfarin, as long as the INR is within their therapeutic range, that's all we're happy about. We don't ask them to stop. Um, most surgeries are under topical anesthesia nowadays, so there's not much uh, blood around or not much chance of increased bleeding. Diabetes, we know that the diabetic control has to be optimal. For cataract surgery to be successful. If it's not, you can get cystoid macular edema, 
your risk of endothelmitis increases and your progression of diabetic retinopathy is also increased as a risk. It's important that the control is tight for a month pre and post surgery. So patients may well, uh, if they're diabetic, it's worth giving them the advice that they need good diabetic control, remember to take their medication, et cetera. See their GP if their BMs are fluctuating prior to them coming to the hospital. What about posture? So in terms to do the surgery, they have to be able to lie flat for around 20 minutes. Uh, most modern beds, trolleys can address posture problems in most patients. Um, there are difficulties with patients with chronic errors limitation who find it difficult to lie flat, Parkinson's disease, and those with neck and back scoliosis. But we can, very unusual not to be able to operate, but it's useful to get the information beforehand in the referral letter to say that this patient has a problem with COAD or his Parkinson's, has a bit of a tremor, uh, such that we can plan accordingly. Let's go to post-operative issues. So all our patients are informed of uh, RSVP. What does that stand for? So R for redness, S sensitivity to light, B loss of vision, and P for pain. So complications in the first week to look out for, infection, endothelitis, keratitis, raised intracular pressure, and trauma uh, can cause problems if, the, if it's sustained in the first week in particular. So that's why we said no heavy lifting, eye rolling, or straining. Complications in the first month, they look like this, local allergy to eye medications. So some people become allergic to the medications we, we give. Normally we give a chlorophenicol and Maxidex or something similar, depending on which department uh, they're in, which hospital they've had the surgery at. They're not unpreserved drops. So some people do develop a, an allergy to the preservatives or at least it irritates them. The other issue, imbalance of vision. So if the one eye is treated, the other eye hasn't been treated. They may have problems with, um, with that, especially the prescription varies by considerable amount. A foreign body sensation uh, can occur. You can get an epithelial defect by the wound. If a suture has been used, sometimes it comes loose and it can irritate the patient. Patient complains of reduced or altered vision. What are the kind of things we're thinking about? So first day, corneal edema it would be the classic uh, reason for that. The first week, you're thinking of thermitis, in which case it's an emergency. And the first fortnight, you're thinking macular edema. This can come on for about six to eight weeks sometimes. Glare and halo, typically as a result of the intraocular lens, uh, especially if it's a multifocal. I'll come on to that a little bit later. Stromal haze, so if you've got corneal edema, that can also cause glare and halo. After about three months, if you get a gradual reduction in vision, it's typically related to posterior capsule opacification. That can be treated with the YAG laser. Flashes and floaters can occur at any time point. When they do occur, they need a dilated retinal examination. It's usually a posterior vitreous detachment, but sometimes you can get a, a retinal tear and if it's untreated, it can result in a detachment. So this is just a, a, an example of what endophthalmitis looks like. It's not something you're gonna miss. They often have a very painful red eye, they'll have a hypopia normally, corneal edema, they may well have some fibrin uh, overlying the intraocular lens. So if you see that, that's gonna be referred in urgently. What we do is a vitreous tap and then intravitreal antibiotics, we usually admit the patient for intensive treatment. So surgery, what does routine surgery look like these days? There's day surgery, uh, in and out, we don't require any fasting. All medi normal medications should be taken on the morning of surgery. Advise no makeup. We don't give preoperative antibiotics. We do give dilating drops or pellets to uh, cause the pupil to dilate ready for surgery. If the patient is particularly anxious, we do offer sedation. In terms of anesthesia, most is going to be topical, so just proximetic and eye drops normally. Um, occasionally, subtenons, if we're thinking that it's going to be a lot of manipulation, for example, maybe to a large or small pupil with hooks. Peribulba is very rarely used these days and is best avoided because you've got a sharp needle close to the eye. Uh, general anesthetic can be used in certain scenarios, quite unusual again these days. We normally discharge patients after about one to two hours. Let's talk a little bit about biometry. So when they come to see us, they do get biometric tests. 
And with the increasing use of premium lenses, the accuracy of IO calculations has never been more critical. Patient expectations are also further on the increase. And a significant number of patients coming for cataract or lens exchange surgery will have had previous laser refractive surgery. So you've got to factor that in to all the calculations. Now the two top biometry machines on the market now, the Zeiss IOL Master and the Hogstrike Lens Tower. In terms of specifications, uh, uh, at Ophthalmic Sons of London, we have the Lenstar LS900. And you can see uh, it's very similar with the uh, IOL Master, but the resolution, for example, for coronal thickness, one micron, arcarotometry 0.01 millimeters, anterior chamber depth, the same, and so on and so forth. So really high, technically advanced, advanced um, equipment. This bit here is quite important, the onboard IOL calculation formula. Uh, and this Hill RBF method is sort of the latest in um, technological developments. So basically it's a, it's a software, RBF stands for radial basis function. It's a sophisticated pattern recognition data interpolation model based on artificial intelligence. Uh, RBF algorithms are already used in things like facial recognition, thumbprint security scanners, financial forecasting, and basically it's so a way of thinking outside the box and independent of uh, your typical virgins formulas. Warren Hill was the sort of genius behind this. So he looked at 260,000 cases and he discovered that 6% of surgeons were getting an accuracy of rate of 84% uh, within plus or minus a half of expected. Less than 1% were achieving a 92% target of that same accuracy. Majority are actually getting around 76 to 80%. And if you think with premium intraocular lenses, that's not a really good outcome. However, if you use the Hill RBF method, 95% achieved plus or minus half accuracy. And that was even when you considered 13 different surgeons in eight different countries. And that's why we use it as the standard of lens calculation uh, in our center. Let's move on to faker multiplication. What does that involve? These are the types of machines. See, this is the crazy top two on the market at the moment, the Centurion, and here is the Bachelon Stellaris. Basically, the fake emulsification tip vibrates at 40,000 hertz, and it's that which is used to break up the lens and suck it up at the same time. So the steps of surgery are incision, then you do what's called the capsulorexis, make an opening in the lens capsule. Um, fake emulsifier is then used to remove the lens, uh, you then remove the cortical material using what's called irrigation aspiration. And the new lens is injected and dialed into position. Most lenses now come in injectable format, which makes this uh, process a lot easier. Um, now, there, there is important consideration. There's also the option of Fento second laser assisted cataract surgery. So this is where we use the Fento second laser to do certain parts of the procedure and then continue with the bigger multiplication component. Um, there's several review articles now showing not much difference from the clinical perspective. Um, there are some important advantages though. Is it more accurate in creating the lens capsule opening? That's yes. Do you get more consistency? The answer is yes. Is it better for premium lenses? The answer arguably yes. And the reason for that is if you have a perfectly centered capsule erexis and your premium lenses sit better, and um, the results are slightly better. This is what you see with the femtosecond laser. So the laser is applied and it makes basically various patterns of uh, lens cutting. And this is your opening in the lens capsule. You can also set various parameters on it. You can set your wounds with it. You can alter how deep you want your uh, lens nucleus cut, etc., etc. There's quite a few advantages in using femtosecond lasers. One is if you've got a very shallow anterior chamber, instead of trying to do a manual capsulorexis, if everything is done with the femtosecond laser, it makes life a lot easier and also uh, safer. So here's a video of standard cataract surgery. So I'll just talk you through that. So basically you make your incisions. 
Uh, then you do here is a capsule rexus made with a very fine needle. And then some hydrogen sections separate the lens from the nucleus. Here comes the fake emulsification probe. Breaks the lens up into uh, little pieces. And then we uh, eat up the lens fragments. There's the irrigation aspiration, removing any cortical remnants. And then here we're putting viscoelastic in. We've loaded the lens up and in it goes. We then tuck it into position. And there we have it. We just hydrate the wounds, make sure everything's watertight. And that's the end of the procedure. In terms of what you see with the femtosecond laser, so you do the femtosecond laser component first, and when you get to the microscope, this is what you see. So you see the rexus has already been done, there's the opening, and the lens has already been cut into four quadrants. These two dots are because we're gonna place a toric lens in later. Uh, that, so the femtosecond laser is quite useful in abnormal corneas. This is an example of um, its use in a patient with radial keratotomy. You very faintly see those previous RK scars. Here the rex has already been made. I'm just removing the lens capsule. Here's the perfectly central capsular rexus. The lens has already been divided into four. So hydrogen section is done. We then remove the, um, the fragments. There we are. And then this is a cortical cleanup. So basically we leave just the capsular bag behind. This is a, an IC8 lens, which I'll come into a bit later. So sometimes we use this in irregular corneas. It has a little pinhole in the middle of it, which basically helps with irregular corneas, allowing patients to see better and giving them more of a range of vision. Let's move on. So let's go on to refractive lens exchange. So essentially, that's the same procedure as cataract surgery, but it's done purely for refractive reasons. Um, we're doing it mainly to reduce the need for glasses. Uh, in some cases, we, we do it also to improve symptoms. So for example, the patient just saw radial keratotomy, didn't particularly have a cataract, but was getting a lot of uh, hypropic shift um, and issues with uh, quality of vision. So she had irregular cornea, so we did the, the refractive lens exchange with the ICA lens to help with that. Important to remember that lens exchange, the expectations are much higher because the vision is uh, not affected like it is in cataract surgery. Um, if they're younger than 50, we're usually offering laser treatment. So this is something that we offer in the 50 plus age group where laser isn't appropriate. In terms, let's move on to lens options. So in terms of the lens options available, let's go back to our eye. So we do cataract surgery, we take out the cataract, and then we have to put a replacement lens in. That replacement lens can be a monofocal lens. So this is a lens um, that can correct either distance or near, but not both. And normally we correct distance, and the biggest issue, of course, is what you do about near vision, <clears throat> and then they need um, reading glasses. Then the other option is the multifocal lens, which gives you better near and distance. And there are various types of these, which I'll, uh, which I'll come on to. So you've got your near vision sorted out and you also get your distance. In terms of the refractive outcome, there's a couple of things you can do um, with the specific lens. With monofocal lenses, you can correct the distance vision in both eyes. You can correct the near vision in both eyes or you can get the monovision. So you can get one eye for distance and the other eye for near. So as the monovision, I only really do that if they are already familiar with monovision. So they've already trialed it in their contact lenses, they're happy with it, they know what it looks like. And usually they come and say, look, can you just replicate what I'm used to? And that's what we do. Similarly with the near vision option, some people are naturally short-sighted and they prefer to stay that way. Uh, some patients can be quite unhappy if you they're minus two in each eye, quite comfortable reading, for example, and then we set them up for distance and then they're forever wearing reading glasses. Um, so it's important to discuss all these things with individual patients before, uh, before doing the surgery. 
Multifocal lenses, you've got various examples now with the extended depth of focus lens, bifocal lenses, and trifocal lenses are pretty much the main types. Careful considerations to lifestyle and expectations. If the decision making is correct, then patients are very happy. If it's not, you can get some very unhappy patients. And important to remember that there's always a compromise in optics. You can't get something for nothing. Let's talk a little bit about extended depth of focus uh, lenses. This is the AMO Symphony or J&J Symphony lens now, which was pretty much the first in the market. And the idea is it gives you an elongated focus, which is supposed to give you a transition that is a bit more natural than the sudden gradations you get with uh, multifocal lenses. Then you have the bifocal lens type. So this is the, the Topcon Lentis type of lens where you have the top bit does your distance and the bottom bit does your near. The near power here can be adjusted. It's similar to actually having a bifocal spectacle frame. You've got your fine vision, trifocal lens design. So you have three focal points, a distance, uh, a near sort of 30 centimeters and then an intermediate range. This is of a toric lens. All these lenses come in toric format. These marks on the lens help us align the lens once they're in the eye. Zeiss also do a trifocal lens design, and there are also various other companies that, that do them. The Synergy lens is a newer lens on the market. That's um, Johnson & Johnson. So basically, what they're claiming here is that it combines the advantages of a trifocal lens with an extended to focus lens. It gives you a much more smoother uh, transition of vision from far to near with less chance of glare and halo effects. Uh, the ICA lens, you saw that in the video earlier. So this we use for irregular corneas, typically RK patients in particular, and effectively has a pinhole within the lens itself. The diameter of the internal pinhole is 1.36 millimeters, and that gives the patient a considerable depth of focus. We use this in the non-dominant eye normally, and in the dominant eye we use a, a standard monofocal lens. The latest kit on the block is this, uh, the Technus Ihance lens. So this is classed as a premium monofocal lens. So it's almost a class of its own really. And it's an uh, innovation in monofocal IOL uh, technology. It gives improved intermediate vision compared with the standard monofocal lens. Um, and basically uses refractive technology. There are no rings. It's based on a continuous high order aspheric surface, so there are no zones either. When you look at it, you can't tell it, you can't tell any differences compared to a monofocal lens. It has the same base geometry as their standard monofocal lens, in fact. Um, the way it works is there's a proprietary aspheric optic. It creates a continuous power profile to enhance the intermediate vision. Um, and, and the real thing, key is with this lens is that the distance vision doesn't drop compared to a monofocal. And the disc photopsia profile, i.e. the chance of it causing glare and halos, is also uh, similar to a monofocal profile. Here you see the defocus curve, and you can see it's quite elongated here, giving you a nice range of intermediate vision. This is at minus one. I'm listening. Oh, that's my Siri phone. Let's switch that off. So uh, the advantage of this is that it gives you good inter intermediate vision, maintains your 20-20 vision, and it has a similar disc photopsy profile to a monofocal lens. This is just a, an animation just showing the, um, how this lens works. So basically that's your standard monofocal at the top, the eye hunts at the bottom. It gives you a nice intermediate range. It's a refractive lens with continuously increasing power, but it's not really discernible to the naked eye. It's very subtle, um, but you do get this uh, increased power here centrally, which gives you the intermediate effect. In terms of what that looks like um, in the real world, here you have your standard monofocal, so you can see quite well in the distance, but your intermediate vision is, is very poor. Um, and then with the IHANS lens, you see that your distance vision is maintained, but the real appeal is that your intermediate vision comes up dramatically. Let's move on. 
Um, so for us, it's, a, it's quite a big game changer. It's our standard lens at Thermic Cells of London. We have a lens bank in the house. It gives you really good um, gain in terms of functional vision. Very little to lose in terms of visual in terms of visual quality, which basically means you can almost offer it to anyone. Um, the additional premium on this isn't high compared to, for example, a multifocal lens, a true multifocal lens. But the real appeal is that you do get pretty good intermediate vision with it. So why use multifocal lenses in general? Well, they increase spectacle freedom. Patient population nowadays are much more demanding. They've done their research, they've done their reading. They come and ask us about it. Refractive lens exchange patients, obviously a huge market there. They come to us because they want to get out of their glasses specifically. It's very useful for the right type of patient. As long as the lenses are customized accordingly, you end up with very happy patients. They are not problem free. So the increase in multifocality, for example, the trifocal lens, you get more of these sort of symptoms of glare, halo, starburst, can get blurry images. They, they don't work well with poor ocular surfaces. So this is all part of the preoperative assessment with these patients to put them to check everything and make sure they're appropriate for a multifocal lens. Uh, they also have low tolerance to small refractive errors, especially astigmatism. So you got astigmatism, anything above a diopter, they don't tolerate that very well and the quality of vision is affected considerably. So important to get the right lens for the right patient. Important to understand what are the patient's expectations and what do they want out of this? What are they prepared to compromise on? Um, what, for example, are they happy to wear glasses for near? Are they happy to wear glasses for computer vision? Important to know all that. Can they accept the possible side effects? So we need to understand the risk of glare, halo, et cetera. The sort of three to 4% chance of needing spectacle wear for certain tasks. Can they accept the risks of surgery? So obviously you've got a cataract, your vision is blurred anyway, so a lot of patients can accept that risk, but with lens exchange, a bit more involved because they can see well with glasses and contacts. So do they want to take the risk, although small, of potentially having a worse outcome than they have currently? Do they need toric lenses? So that comes in with the investigations. We always do topography for these patients. And are they aware of the possibility of top-up lasers? So Sometimes, yes, the biometry, we get it, I would say 96, 97% right bang on target most of the time. But there is a 3% chance they may need a laser top up, especially if they've had a multifocal lens in, to uh, get them to where they need to be. And patients need to understand that from the outset so that there's no surprises afterwards. If you do that, you end up with very happy patients. And I think I'll leave it there. And um, thank you very much. I'll just stop the share. I'll hand you back to Pravi. There you go. Thanks very much, Ali. That was a, a great lecture. I hope everyone found it as informative as I did. We do actually have quite a few questions, Ali, so I'm going to start presenting to you if that's all right. Sure. Um, one of them is, Ali, does tamsulosin create problems during lens extraction? Thank you. Yeah, that's a really good question. So tamsulosin is, um, is a very popular drug prescribed for prostate. So uh, typically, obviously, your male, your male clientele. But yeah, there is a known association with um, uh, creating floppy irises. And the issue there is when you get to cataract surgery, if you've got a floppy iris, you may need to use hooks to keep it dilated. And the other issue is sometimes it comes out of the wound. So it can create havoc. Uh, what we do is, is to put information to know beforehand. So again, it's quite useful to have the referral letter, either from the optimum or the GP because there are things we can do during the surgery to reduce the chance of problems. So what we do is um, we tend to give intracameral phenylephrine um, or there's something called migraine. What that does, it A, keeps the people as dilated as possible, but B, has a really strong effect against preventing the floppiness uh, of the iris and thereby uh, reducing any surprises. It's interesting, sometimes, like when I've um, done surgery and, you know, there is no, there is no prior history of the uh, tamsulosin. And suddenly you do the opening. This iris isn't behaving very well. What's going on? And you later discover actually this patient was on tamsulosin, but just didn't declare it. And, you know, so that's uh, uh, sometimes there's any doubt. We would put intracameral phenylephrine in the surgery if you feel things are not behaving. Great, thanks, Ali. Uh, the next one is if 
but there is an irritable eye post cataract surgery. For example, if they've had to use a suture and the suture is loose, what would an, what would an optometrist be expected to do in that situation? So, yeah, another good question. So, yeah, they come to the optometrist and say, look, I've got this uh, irritation in my eye, and then you look at the eye, if you take the vision, look at the corneas, etc. make sure there's no infiltrate. But what you'll see with a broken suture is literally that. You just see a suture end that's, that's free on each side. You won't see... Uh, a joined up suture. If you do see that, um, then the next thing to do is put fluorescein in, look for any leaks. That's the main thing you want to check for. So you want to see, is the wound okay? So you're looking for any sign of Seidel's positivity. If there's no Seidel's sign, um, you, if you feel confident, you can remove the stitch. You do need some very fine forceps. So some nice dis disposable ones available from um, Melosa Medical. Single-use disposables are quite good. Uh, and if you've got a steady hand, you can just go in there and grab it and literally just tug it out. But again, it does depend on how confident you are, whether you've done it before. Um, those optometrists who've been with us in the eye clinics, for example, have had a chance to manipulate things, putting in plugs, for example, with those same forceps. And if you're used to doing that, there's no issue with Gracie grabbing that stitch and pulling it out. What I would recommend is put some proxy in so it doesn't hurt the patient. And then you literally have to hold the upper lid. Um, just get, get your position right on the slit lamp, get your forceps ready. And then um, yeah, you go in, you just grab it, and then literally it's a crude tug. And you find it just comes away you know, very easily in most cases. If you have a problem or you're not comfortable doing that, then the best thing is to send that patient to casualty, uh, one of the hard casualties, or if they come from a private clinic, send them back to us and we'll slot them in and we'll. Um, will remove them. Uh, the, the worry is if you leave it, they can then become infected, you then get an infiltrate, can then go with a nasty corner ulcer, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So if they do have that kind of level of irritation, uh, they will present to you because they'll, they can't tolerate it. They'll be like, oh, there's something not right here. You know, and, and, uh, and yeah, so either manage it in-house or refer on. I'm sure a lot of us will be referring that onwards, Ali. <laughs> Um, the next question I have is, who would not be suitable for a multifocal and how can you predict a successful outcome of a multifocal IOR? Yes, yeah, so that's another good question. So we do a lot of tests to work out suitability for multifocality and types of multifocal lens. There's a whole uh, process that we do. So as well as topography, biometry, we also um, obviously take the history, uh, we look at the eye, some of the key things that you will see on the eye that stops them from having multifocals. You know, if they've got nasty blepharitis, if they've got dry eyes, if they've got punctate changes in the cornea, any sign of Fuchs, so any little changes. So there's a quite, any ocular surface issue will have a huge effect on whether we offer multifocals and the type of multifocal we offer. And then as you move into the eye, you look at the, the retina and are there any changes there? So often we'll be doing OCT maculas. We're looking for any drusen, any sign of macular degeneration. If they're diabetic, how bad is the diabetic retinopathy? Is it non-existent? In which case, there may still be a candidate. Do they have background? Do they have maculopathy? Do they have, et cetera. So, so all that will come into play in terms of whether they can have multifocality and also into play to what type of multifocal lens they can have. So some patients may not be suitable for the full trifocal, for that, you really have to have a pristine ocular uh, system all the way from the front to the back. Um, if you don't, then there are various scenarios and other lenses you can offer. For example, the, the iHeart's lens is a lot more forgiving. You don't tend to get the glare and halo. The other thing to consider is the patient's psychology and what they're expecting. So that's also really important because um, some patients' expectations are such that you cannot deliver on what they want and others uh, are much more accepting and you get everything else in between. So it is, um, that comes with experience of how to manage uh, that sort of scenario and what patients are suitable for what lenses. Thankfully, most of the time we get it right, but yeah, if you get it wrong, it's a real, it's a real uh, diff difficult scenario. The other thing to remember is a lot of patients uh, can come back with problems, and it's important to know how to manage those problems. So yes, some people do, do come up with glare and halo, with uh, ocular surface issues, 
and uh, a lot of that stuff can be managed and treated. Um, so it's very unusual actually if you get your period assessment right and bang on, very unusual to uh, have, have issues afterwards. But if you don't get your period pre assessment right, you put them in willy-nilly, you, you do get problems afterwards. Ali, um, one of them is what percentage of these patients do suffer with glare with the multifocus? And also, I know there's a period of new adaptation. How long generally does it take to add up to the multifocal IOLs and also to adapt to the glare and the halos and all the other side effects you might get? Another good question. So I, I typically say, look, about, I don't normally say about 10% of patients will get some kind of glare and halo issue. Um, I, I normally say it's about visually disabling and maybe about three or four percent okay so uh, i do warn patients that they will have some and the other thing i, I remind patients of is that we do get glare and halo anyway so even us right now at night we get glare we get halo we you're driving in your car you get it you look at your the other cars coming along the headlamps you're seeing glare and halo so it's very important to remind patients that they they do get that that doesn't go away and there has to be differentiation between what is your normal versus a little bit of accentuation that you get with the multifocal lens. In terms of disabling, uh, it's very unusual. In terms of adaptation, I normally give it about three to six months, actually. Typically, it gets better with every month that passes. And we've had a few patients, as you know, probably, who initially come in and they say, oh, you know, it's awful, I can't tolerate them. And then a couple of months later, they're like, oh, it's all gone. So, uh, yeah. Adaptation is also very variable between individual patients. It's a very personal um, thing, I find. And there's a few questions on the eye hunt lens, actually. One of them is, how do you know if it's positioned properly so it gives you the full range of vision? And alongside of that, um, do you ever do a micro monovision with an EDOF or an eye hunt lens in one eye um, and obviously a monofocal or something else in, in the other eye? Okay. Oh, good question. Everyone's on fire today. Uh, yes. Yeah. So the eye house lens, how do we know it's in the right position? Well, if you get your capsular rexus centered and the lens goes in the bag, then the haptics expand. They're, such, they're designed as such to expand to fill up the capsular bag, which ensures that that lens is central. It's very unusual for it to move after you put it in the right um, configuration, as long as it's in the bag and as long as it's free from your capsular rexus. So it's important to make sure the rexus is smaller than your um, lens optic. And that's, again, where femtosecond lasers have a slight advantage because you get it bang on every time, 5.5 millimeters, boom, that's what it is. Whereas with a manual capsular rexus, you know, you're, you're, given that you're talking millimeters and you're relying on your hand to do it, there is a little bit of variation, no matter how good you are. In terms of the second question, was the micro monovision? Yes, it's a very good and useful tool. Um, so what I tend to do with the ions lens in particular is we tend to do the uh, the dominant eye first and to give them the distance. As for, there'll be different ways of doing it depending on surgeon preference. I I prefer doing dominant eye first, get the distance bang on target, and then I establish what kind of reading vision do they have in that eye, and are they happy with it. If they're happy with it, I'll do exactly the same with the other eye. If I'm not happy with it, or well, rather not me, but they are not happy with it, and they feel actually it's not bad, it's really good for the computer, but you know what, I could do with a little bit more reading power. I want to be able to see my phone. I want to be able to read a book at 30 centimeters. In that scenario, yeah, then I'll, I'll target about minus one, minus 1.5 with the other eye putting in the eye haunt lens. And actually it works really well. They, 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 they don't lose so much the distance vision, as compared to a standard monofocal lens, but they gain a lot of near vision and it, it gives them pretty much spectacle freedom. As a really useful tool, especially for those where, you know, the trifocal lens, for example, is not an option. Um, Ali, just a couple more actually, if that's right. Yeah. Um, one of them is regarding the multifocal lenses. How many of your patients still need reading glass Okay. Um, after that and also to tag on to that I know if you could talk about that yeah so so yeah so, so how many do you need reading glass I typically quote about three to four percent so that's what I do in my sort of preamble with the uh, with the patient when I'm up 
you know, talking to them, preemptively counseling them. And the reality is that actually very few of them need reading glasses. I would say less than one, less than 1% is the actual figure. However, it's important to underplay that because everyone's a bit different. And if you're in the under 1% who needs the readers, you feel quite aggrieved having had multifocal lenses. So I normally say, yeah, it's about three to 4%. I would say the reality is less than 1% is very unusual, especially with trifocal lenses to need any form of reading, glass, reading glasses. And it also depends on what they do. So if they're a watchmaker or something very specific, again, it's important to understand that and advise them and say, look, you're not gonna get the detail you need to see those little things within your, you know, within your watch or whatever it is that you're doing. So you will need top up readers. Again, all, all of this is all about balancing and um, managing expectations, under promising, over delivering. That's the way to do it. And if patients come in and ask for everything, I sort of kind of push away and say, you know what, we, we can't deliver that. And you just be honest with them and they appreciate that. Uh, it's much better then say, yeah, we can do that, put the lens in, and then they come in afterwards and say, look, I thought I could read at all distances. I can't read, doctor, what are you going to do? And, and then, you know, it's a, it's a difficult conversation. What was the other question? Are you there? Are you there, Prabhu? Yeah. As opposed to the traditional focus. So say again, I lost you there. Sorry, do you like the performance of the Technus Ihance lens? And in which patients would you advocate its use opposed to the traditional multifocals or EDOS? Yeah, we're, we're learning a lot with it uh, at the moment. So we, we've just started using it literally um, uh, within the last couple of months. So it was launched at um, September at the ESCRS meeting in Europe. And it's uh, injectable format. I think it was available in sort of October, November. And we've been using it increasingly sort of December, January, Feb, obviously before the lockdown. And I have to say, it's pretty, pretty impressive. Um, that's why we've adopted it as our, pretty much our bank um, premium monofocal lens. Um, I, I would say it, it kind of depends on um, the patient's expect expectations. Again, for cataract surgery, cataract surge, um, patients having cataract surgery, we offer that as our standard. If they're very particular about the reading, so the reading at 30 centimeters, that, that I, would, I still do the, the trifocal lenses for. At the moment, I'm using the fine vision. I have had some really good results with the, the Johnson Johnson Synergy lens, which uh, is supposed to be sort of more of an extended depth of focus trifocal thing. So we'll see how that goes. But the thing with lenses, they, they, the new lenses come out every year. Uh, so at the ESCRS meeting, for example, we had, you know, probably about 30, 40 new lenses now. So uh, we supported to sort of trial a few of them, gauge how they respond from the patient perspective, and then um, and think about incorporating into the practice. But yeah, the eye has been, been phenomenal. So that's probably our go-to lens right now. And then for those patients, refractive lens exchange, they want a bit more they already can see really well with glasses. So for those, we still have the trifocal option. Thanks, sorry. sorry, before we end, there is one final question. Um, are you a fan of monovision in, in refractive lens exchange or cataract surgery? And which eye do you, what do you aim as the reading eye? And which eye do you do first? Okay, another good question. Yeah, I'm a big fan of monovision. I, particularly for those patients who are already used to it. So I, I never talk a monovision patient, for example, they, they're used to wearing monovision. I never talk them into uh, having multifocal lenses. If you do that, it's a recipe for disaster. Um, so now I'm a huge fan. So uh, either refractive lens exchange or cataract surgery. So refractive lens exchange, nowadays I would use the iHance lens for that purpose. So target the, as I said before, dom if I'm using the iHance, do the dominant eye first, and then the non-dominant eye, uh, I would target depending on what they see at the intermediate range in the dominant eye. So you can adjust to either minus one and a half or minus two is your target. For cataract patients, if you're using a traditional monofocal, which I don't do often nowadays, but if you do, then it's the same, I target. Uh, I normally do the near eye first, uh, aim for about minus two, minus 1.75 thereabouts. 
The reason for that is that you've got a little bit of leeway. So if you get it out of target slightly with the near eye, it doesn't have a huge impact on the patient. You can then use that information to target the, uh, the distance eye. The same goes for the RD patient. I know I said I normally do the dominant eye, but you can do it both ways around. The difference with the eye haunts in the RLE type of patient is they actually get really good reading vision. And surprisingly, surprisingly so, sometimes they get really good vision that you, uh, you didn't expect. So that's why it's important to know where, where they're going to be at. You don't want to compromise their distance vision too much uh, when you do the other right if you, if you don't have to. Whereas if you're using monofocal lenses, um, you know their distance vision is going to be compromised in the near eye significantly. So you might as well do that eye first, see where they're at reading-wise, see how close to target you were, and then adjust your target for the other eye. Um, yeah. Ali, thank you very much. I think we're going to leave the questions there, if that's okay. Um, I am going to launch a poll now to everybody. So you could just take your time to fill in the questions and just uh, with the answers that would be great for those who are watching this on a device you may have to click the launch poll button that may turn up so thank you very much for listening um we will be having another wa another webinar next friday and that will be given by susan Suranapani, who is another consultant ophthalmologist at ocl and she will be talking about dry eye some of you may have visited her in house before but it will be a slightly adapted lecture so please join us for that to all of you that are registered for this one the link to register for next friday's webinar will go out on monday so please look for that um, and if there are any further questions please feel free to email me and i will get back to you as soon as i can it's paulv at ocrvision.com and thank you to everyone i hope you have a lovely afternoon and ali thanks again that was a, a great webinar thank you very much thank you guys thank you have a good, have a good friday